Hello, in this video and later blog post, I will be taking you back, back to when there were predominantly black farmers, but during the civil rights, majority of the farmers were foreclosed illegally and ripped from their lands. You see, shortly after slavery had ended, many of the slaves had bought their owners lands and that got carried on to their kids and so on and so forth with that. Because although the owners owned slaves, most of them didn't know much about farming. Then when many slaves dispersed and migrated to the north and the depression came, they lost a lot of money. So former slaves agreed to take over their lands. At some point, many blacks had owned over 70% of the farmlands, which we all know didn't go so well. I mean, how dare they take over Africa and then come here and take over the US and not long before the UK and UN which I did talk about in a video I will leave a link below anyway well as we all know racism became higher and segregation was implemented and thanks to racist President Woodrow Wilson initiating the segregation after it being written in the Constitution by Supreme Court in 1896 which was quoted as separated but equal which was a counter reaction from Jim Crow laws that revived principles of the 1865 and 1866 black codes, which had previously restricted the civil rights and civil liberties of African Americans. Oh, yes. President Woodrow was also the one who covered up the findings of ancient Egyptian artifacts found in the Grand Canyon, of them being the initial slash race to have discovered America thousands of years before the Indians and the Vikings. Oh yes, take a look at this. This is a video that I always wanted to do. And I know some of you may be bored to tears with this particular subject because if it ain't celebrity gossip, a lot of you don't really care. But for those of you who came for some brain food, grab a snack and let's go in. As we all know, and we're told that Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492. Well, that's been debunked, shredded, and burned. No one believes that crap. But then history scholars started saying that the Vikings discovered America around the year 1000 AD. Well, that got debunked right away. And then there was a rumor that Asians were the ones 15,000 years ago. It seems they walked across the Bering Land Bridge that used to connect what is now the U.S. state of Alaska and Siberia 15,000 years ago. Ocean levels were much lower and the land between the continents was hundreds of kilometers wide. But there isn't any proof of this, just a bunch of myths. But however, most of us were told that the Indians discovered America. Well, people, I hate to tell you, none of them didn't. I know shocking. Guess who really discovered America? Yes, ancient Egyptians. It seems to be more findings of them arriving in America first before anyone else. But the story is quickly covered up and or not publicized as much. For example, it was some findings of them in the Grand Canyon. But hey, it gets deeper. It seems that a man named G.E. Kincaid was among the first to have entered the cave when he was working for S.A. Jordan. Visitors were restricted from entering thereafter, especially after President Woodrow Wilson in 1919 signed slash created the Grand Canyon National Park Act. So now FBI agents now guard the cave. Oh yes, guess what? They found a gold Egyptian shrine holding lotus flowers which originated from Egypt. The Egyptian shrine was in the first cross tunnel in the tunnel, which was the exact same location that the Shriners were in the Valley of the Kings tunnels, cities, where Egyptians lived. Before the kings of ancient Egypt began to build pyramids and above ground, you know, cities in Egypt, as we all know, the pyramids were constructed between 2600 to 2611 BC. Oh yes, this is why the architectural design of the pyramid is pretty much seen all over the world. Which brings us to civil rights and all of the rallies and marches. You see, it was in 1935 under the president's supervision of racist Franklin Roosevelt who implemented the Social Security Act of 1935, excluded from coverage about half the workers in the American economy. Among the excluded groups were agriculture and domestic workers, a large percentage of whom were African Americans. 
This has led some scholars to conclude that policymakers in 1935 deliberately excluded African Americans from the social security system because of prevailing racial bias during that period. Which brings us to the civil rights movement. But with all of that fighting, killing and so on, you see they were stealing lands from blacks left and right. By the end of civil rights movement, it went from us owning 70% to 50% to a mere 11% and lower of black farmers. The takeover had commenced. Take a look at this. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Over the 20th century, black people in the U.S. were dispossessed of 12 million acres of land. Half of that loss, 6 million acres, occurred over just two decades, from 1950 to 1969, a period largely associated with the civil rights struggle. This mass land dispossession, which affected 98 percent of black agricultural landowners, is part of the pattern of institutional racism and discrimination that's contributed to the racial wealth gap in the United States. States. Many of the driving forces behind this land theft were legal and originated in federal policies. In a new article on the history of this massive land theft, our next guest writes, unlike their counterparts even two or three generations ago, black people living and working in the Delta today have been almost completely uprooted from the soil. Van Newkirk is a staff writer at The Atlantic, where he covers politics and policy. His new piece, The Atlantic's September cover story, is headlined The Great Land Rise. Robbery. Can you tell us what this robbery is, Van? Yes. So the robbery refers to uh, over the course mostly of the, the 20th century, in the mid 20th century and beyond, uh, federally funded uh, and federally directed in some cases, uh, discriminatory effort against African American farmers that wound up uh, by several mechanisms uh, with those farmers losing, like you said, six million acres of land over just 19 years, from 1950 to 1969, uh, and most of it concentrated around the civil rights movement, uh, with a lot of that land being taken, a lot of those funds being denied purposefully with the intent of keeping black folks from protesting for their civil rights. So explain this period, this pivotal period, uh, when millions of acres were taken from uh, black Americans, uh, 1950 to 1969. Right. Uh, the federal government has—they uh, they installed a couple of programs during the Great Depression that were basically created American agriculture as we know it today. Uh, they subsidize, uh, heavily subsidize crop growing um, and controlled prices uh, when commodity prices went, went too low. And uh, they also promoted the creation of larger and larger and more and more consolidated farms. Those efforts uh, serve to uh, drive lots of small farmers of all races off their farms, but it actually manifested in a kind of novel and uh, even more dire way in heavily black places in the United States. So black folks didn't have a whole lot of land, but they did have sizable holdings in places like Mississippi, which I wrote about. Uh, but what those federal reforms did is they uh, gave the money to locally elected boards, and in places across the Deep South, black folks could not vote on those boards. So basically, it gave the plantation owners, their children, their grandchildren, the, the people who had been on the side of the Confederacy in the Civil War and their descendants, it gave them even more power to dispossess and disenfranchise black farmers, and they used that power pretty extensively, to the tune of almost the entirety of black farming collapsing. I want to turn to a video of Willina Scott White, who's featured in your piece, Van. The Scott family is one of the few families who were able to reclaim land that was possessed by the USDA. She talks here about what happened to her father's land and what that land means to her family. It grieves me that we were denied a history, and that's how I see it. Um, and I'm trying not to cry. It's dear to me that my children know what my ancestors went through for us to be where we are and who we are. Because I'm a firm believer that if we don't know our history, then we repeat the mistakes over and over again. My dad's land was taken 
it was not foreclosed on by USDA. My dad went in and applied for money to irrigate his beans because it was so hot. The county agent refused to give him a loan to water his crops. He said, uh, y'all not supposed to be farming like this. Y'all farming like white folk. So he cut everything in half that year. This is when they started not being able to get enough money to farm with. Atlantic Studios. Uh, then, can you tell us the story of the Scott family, how their land was lost, how they came to regain it? Lena's grandfather, Ed Scott Sr., he uh, came from Alabama and, and got over to Mississippi in the late 19th century. He became a, a titan in his corner of Mississippi, was just an incredibly gifted farmer, uh, was in many ways more well-respected than some local white farmers by the white establishment. And he was one of those farmers who was just talented and lucky enough to be able to purchase a plot of land, his first 100 acres, from a local guy, P.H. Brooks, a, a white landowner. And he became one of the, the early middle-sized uh, landowners, uh, black landowners in the region. He encouraged all of his children to get their own plots of land. They, they kept it all in common. And over the course of his lifetime, built up, just through sheer talent and force of will, uh, about a thousand acres of land. His son, Ed Scott Jr., took over in the middle of the 20th century, took over. He, he fought in World War II, came back, and also became an incredibly talented farmer and farm manager. He also added to that, those land holdings. He, what both of them did, that marked them as really unique is they managed to not really dabble in or, or seek out federal funds. Uh, they, they relied, uh, they emphasized heavily uh, self-sustainability and leaning on private funding to keep their farm afloat. But in the 1970s and 80s, when we had the major farm crisis and, and inflation crisis, Ed Scott Jr. had to reach out for federal money. And like Willina said, uh, when he started reaching out, he, he got a little bit the first year, but then you see the local power structures realize this guy's maybe farming like white folks. He drives, the, the trucks he drives are a little too shiny. And uh, the, the real difficulty, difficulty comes when he tries to get into catfish farming, which is heavily subsidized by the federal, by the federal government. They only offer him uh, the dollar amount that's about half of the average comparable white farmer, who is frankly way less competent than Ed Scott Jr. in the region. He gets half the money they get. So even starting out on that endeavor, the catfish endeavor, it's, an, it's doomed from the start. And so they lose a lot of their land pretty quickly over the 80s and early 90s. And uh, Willina, and uh, Willina kind of shepherded him through the major black farmers lawsuit, where they won a lot of it back on a discrimination case against the USDA. So you talk about how ultimately Wall Street got very interested in the land. You write, for example, the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association, TIAA, one of the largest pension firms in the country, as well as other corporate entities that all own tens of thousands of acres of land in Mississippi and surrounding states. How did these companies come to own this land? And what about the issue of reparations? Farmland wasn't originally considered a really valuable investment asset. It's, farmland's volatile. Uh, it's difficult to predict from year to year what your yield's going to be, what your rents are going to be. It is a, an asset that has been considered uh, really below sort of the sterling grade of investment classes. But in, after the Great Recession, when the dollar weakened, and with the future threats of both climate change and overpopulation, really pl placing a premium both on land and on arable land for the production of food that's only going to increase in value, farmland became much more attractive to large investors, particularly pension funds. Uh, TIAA, which I write about in the piece, is kind of emblematic of the very sudden interest of pension funds in farmland across the United States. Right now, pension funds in the Mississippi Delta own more land than black folks do there. And how that connects to my story is farmland, most of the farmland in the U.S. is owned already. So where are investors going to look for land from? And it's going to be where it's coming up for auction, where it already is packaged into really large parcels. And that happens most often in the places where it's been stolen from black folks or is being stolen from black folks. 
So the Mississippi Delta is where some of the largest portfolios in the U.S. are. Uh, connecting to reparations, uh, for one, you know, Wall Street is a major interest right now in farmland that was once owned by black folks. And we have to reckon with that. And we have to reckon with the fact that it was United States federal policy that allowed that. So how do we reckon with the fact that now this lucrative asset class is making money for lots of people, lots of people across the country who have pension funds, maybe even outside the country, and it's not making money for the African-American farmers and, and descendants of those farmers who live there, who were enslaved there, and who made the land uh, and, and who were basically tied to it and were discriminated against there. I think reparations has to be a part of that conversation. You have to start thinking about if the federal government took this money away, they've got to find a way to invest it back in, into them. And if you think about this as a federal investment in white farmers, in Wall Street eventually, why wouldn't it be ethical? Why wouldn't it be necessary for the federal government to invest in black farmers the same way? You're talking about something like 12 million acres of land. That's about the size of Vermont and New Hampshire combined. Your final comment, Van. Yeah, 12 million acres. Uh, it is a staggering amount of land, and it amounts to somewhat something north of hundreds of billions to perhaps trillions of dollars worth of land, legacy, culture lost. That's something, that's titanic. And whatever policy comes next has to be just as titanic. Van Newkirk, we want to thank you so much for being with us, staff writer at The Atlantic, where he covers politics and policy. We will link to your latest piece, The Atlantic's September cover story, The Great Land Robbery, the shameful story of how one million black families have been ripped from their farms. So you see, the takeover was an agenda to keep blacks suppressed and poor and not in control. They did this by forcing the blacks out of their farms, businesses, and so on, by any means necessary. Take a look at this. I want y'all take a look at that sign up there. See what it says? Cash for your home. You know what that is? No, no more. What are y'all, Amos and Andy? Are you stepping and he's fetching? I'm talking about the message, what it stands for. It's called gentrification. It's what happens when the property value of a certain area is brought down. Huh? You listening? Yeah. They bring the property value down. They can buy the land at a lower price. Then they move all the people out, raise the property value, and sell it at a profit. Now, what we need to do is we need to keep everything in our neighborhood, everything, black. Black owned with black money. Just like the Jews, the Italians, the Mexicans, and the Koreans do. Ain't nobody from outside bringing down the property value. It's these folk shooting each other and selling that crack rock and shit. Well, how you think the crack rock gets into the country? We don't own any planes. We don't own no ships. But we are not the people who are flying and floating that shit in here. I know every time you turn on the TV, that's what you see. Black people selling the rock, right. pushing the rock, yeah. pushing the rock. Yeah, I know. But that wasn't a problem as long as it was here. It wasn't a problem until it was in Iowa, and it showed up on Wall Street where there are hardly any black people. Now, if you want to talk about uh, guns, why is it that there's a gun shop on almost every corner in this community? Why? Tell you why. For the same reason that there's a liquor store on almost every corner in the black community. Why? They want us to kill ourselves. You go out to Beverly Hills, you don't see that shit, but they want us to kill ourselves. Yeah, the best way you can destroy a people, you take away their ability to reproduce themselves. Yeah. Who is it that's dying out here on these streets every night? Y'all. Yeah. Young brothers like yourselves. What am I supposed to do? Fool roll up, try to smoke me? I'm gonna shoot the motherfucker if he don't kill me first. You're doing exactly what they want you to do. You have to think, young brother, about your future. You see, they wanted to be in charge. Now, you all have to understand, around the time of civil rights, blacks owned a lot of businesses as well, and most of us were, in fact, Republicans. It was shortly after the civil rights, whereas we didn't own very much anymore, until here now, most of us are living with limited means and are idolizing Hollywooders and is taught to, yes, to go to college, 
but do that to get a good job instead of creating jobs and dynasties we're not taught to own things like we used to we became what they think we are animals thieves and so on this does not speak for all blacks because all blacks are not the same but I see us coming back and taking what has been stolen from us, something that the late attorney Johnny Cochran had begun until he was misdiagnosed and shortly died. You see, they prey on blacks' ignorance, diagnosing people with conditions to keep you constantly in their depths and lucky for them dead. Wake up. The agenda is deeper than you think. Oh, and stay tuned for the blog about this. Hey, don't go anywhere. There's more. Oh, and, and it's good, especially for you deaf teachers and y'all always try to do. I mean, it is really good. Really good. I mean, you guys are going to love this. My girl's mind. Mind. Excuse me? You are the one taking your dear sweet twine. Hey, don't rush me. I will. Then get with it then. I mean, hurry up. What's taking so long? Just do it. I mean, taking you a little time, make, trying to make it all theatrical, just go ahead and say what you have to say. Stop taking your freaking time. Tell them about this go stuff, because we uh, need to have way. this. What? Don't you dare zap me away. Don't you dare. Now that we got that headache out of the way, I can finally tell you about my new blog. Yes, my website. That means you can read all of my scripts in detail, pictures, videos, receipts, plenty receipts okay just in case you may have lost what i said or didn't understand what i was saying you can read in detail of everything i've said and then analyze for yourself oh yes oh and there's one more thing that i have done i'm actually starting a videography business that does not mean that i'm going to your events and recording your events no that means i take the photos video clips whatever from those events and i create magic all the details are below have a great day bye